welcome back to Max Reaction. How are you doing today? Hopefully you're having a good day. I am. I got off work a little bit early today. So we're going to react to a video that I've been wanting to react to for a while. It's a longer video. This is Philippines, the hidden history of ancient kingdoms and empires. So we've been talking about a lot of recent history, you know. Even if it happened 100 years ago, that's still recent history. Well, this is ancient history. So we're going to learn a lot. A lot of the early uh, time periods of the Philippines, so this should be really interesting. Um, I can't wait to learn everything about it. I'm sure when we react to this and watch it, it's going to raise more questions so we can explore more into the deep, deep history of the Philippines and uh, we'll make more videos on it because I think it's just, you know, so, so fascinating to look so deep into the history. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Let's react together. If you stick around to the end, I know it's a long video, probably almost, you know, by the time it's done, maybe almost an hour or so. Uh, uh, definitely comment what you're thinking down below, but for now, let's react. The Philippines is much more than what it seems. Beauty? Talent? Much more than that. much more than what some people may give it credit for. Right. Number four, Philippines. Beauty, talent, lots of beauty and talent. Much more than what it now is. Earthquakes, oh. Typhoons. It's not an American territory or a Spanish colony. Right. It's more than that. The Philippine Islands has its own history and heritage. Absolutely. A history and heritage that was nearly forgotten by the hundreds of years of Spanish conquest and American control. We can't forget it. There's a reason why some Filipinos and Filipinas don't like the Spanish or American eras. Because those eras only reflect the recent history of the islands. And I agree, like, you have every right to not to like those errors. Those are uh, terrifying, bad errors, but I think the Filipino people grew up, grew as a person and got much stronger. They were always strong, but stuff like that strengthens you. It really does. What I will discuss is what I know from my own experience and a valuable contribution by a Filipino who also seeks to expand the knowledge of the islands and let people know the hidden truth. Philippines. This is exciting. In ancient times, the Philippines was the most southern point of Asia. Trujaya was connected to mainland Asia through the Malacca Strait and trade with the Thai and Khmer peoples. The rest of Indonesia was not considered Asia. As really? once you get to the most western islands of the region, you have Pacific people's culture and language. A good example is Papua New Guinea. So in many respects, the Philippines was the edge of Asia. The Philippines right. was the natural melting point of Asia. All peoples from the whole of Asia would gather in the Philippine region due to its natural seafaring routes. Peoples from China, Korea, Japan, Siam, India, all the nations, and even certain Middle Eastern wow. countries have evidence of being in the Philippines. This is why some people who do not fit this stereotypical Asian look live right. in the Philippines and are true Filipino. In modern times, Malaysia and Indonesia are considered to be melt as well, but these are fake, artificial European colonies Whoa. which forced cultures together. Whoa. The Philippines being a natural melting and mixing of the people and faiths. Islam was first introduced to Southeast Asia through the Malacca Strait and was being spread throughout the region and into the southern Philippines. But the Spanish put a strict halt to the Islamization of the Philippines. The Spanish knew what it was like to deal with Islam. Spain wow. itself was under an Islamic caliphate. Intense times. The Reconquista happened only a few centuries before, and they did not want to deal with it in one of their colonies. Which brings up the question, why did the Spanish take the Philippines at all? Right. The Spanish wanted a way to their colonies in South America by way of the Pacific Ocean. They eventually came upon the Philippines and used it as a stopper on their way to Mexico. But unlike South America, none of the Philippines was truly under Spanish control at any one time. 
Wow, that's saying something, you know? Um, they just want it as a stop-off point. They they want to ruin these people's lives that are in the Philippines just because they want a rest area, basically. Uh, that's what he's saying. But he also said they weren't truly over Spanish rule fully ever. I mean, that's now that's a statement. That is a big statement. Sulu was so dangerous and so difficult to control, it existed as a sort of autonomous region with only occasional Spanish communication. This would remain well into effect in the American colonial era of the Philippines. The Sulu Sultanate would only truly come to an end in the modern times when the modern nation of the Philippines would make a deal with the Sulu rebels. The Sulu Peninsula being an autonomous region, essentially they can do whatever they want with minimal contact from the government. Let's go into detail about native Philippine dynasties. I think that's 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 fair, you know, the Sulu Swatten. Um, I don't know much about it. I don't know much about it. So if you want me to react on some stuff about that, definitely give me some links or something so I can learn more. But you know, they're ruling over this land, and then you inform a government. So uh, you know, it was their land, right? Right. Just like Spanish wanted to come over and take over the land, or America wanted to come over and take the land. And uh, once you make a deal, it's a deal, right? So, uh, very interesting. I'm learning a lot already in the first, like, six, five or six minutes, I've learned a ton. So this is, this is awesome. Yes, there were native dynasties in the Philippines. Some people may not think that such a thing was possible in the Philippines, but yes, it is true. I have some information Ooh. provided by one Pinoy. After reading this information, I decided to narrate the entire entry because this is the truth and people need to know this. We need the this truth. This <laughs> is about the Kingdom of Luzon. The Kingdom of Luzon from the years 1279 through 1571 was an ancient telesocracy once located around the Manila Bay region of the Philippines. Hmm. Its capital was Tondo, meaning Eastern Capital. Its territories covered most of what is now Central Luzon, right. extending from the Delta region that surrounds Manila Bay all the way into the interior along headwaters of the surrounding rivers in the provinces of Panga and Big area. Many Philippine historians question the term empire when applied to ancient Luzon. Why? The main dynasty, Chinese sources use the term Guo, a sovereign kingdom ruled by kings and not chieftains. Yet the actions of Luzon are evidenced by Portuguese chroniclers in the early 1500s. Its effort to control and manipulate the politics and economy of neighboring countries around the streets of Malacca is not the action of a mere kingdom, but rather that of an empire. Since China recognized only one empire under heaven, they recorded Luzon merely as a kingdom, as they did with other empires of that period like Japan and Siam. Luzon was at best a telocracy, a trading empire like Brunei and Malacca, or the earlier Majapahit and Srijaya empires of Java and Sumatra. Luzon was probably derived from Luzon. Luzon was the old Kapampangan name from Manila Bay. The Kapampangan ethnic group who once occupied most of its northern and western banks were a seafaring people that traditionally gave names to bodies of water that served as their highways. Wow. The communities that grew from these are named after these bodies of water. The word Lusong in both Kapampangan and Tagalog can be defined as 1. A mortar or wooden pylon used for pounding rice. 2. To plunge and or to ride with the wind or current in both Kapampangan and Tagalog. Manila Bay may have been named Lusong by both groups because the rivers within their settlements all plunge and empty themselves into it. Three. Isn't that interesting of how, you know, they got their names? Um, it all makes sense. When you sit down and listen to this man talk about it, uh, it all makes sense. It really does. Also, the land below the wind, according to other traditions, while Sun Song, China, referred to the above the wind, since Sun Song is a Kapapangan and Tagalog word which means to sail against the wind. In Chinese tradition, however, Lu Song is made up of two characters, Lu, which means backbone or 
Empire's substitute and Song, which refers to the Song Empire. In the southern Chinese dialect by Cantonese Hokkien and Chaozu, the character Lu is added before a name to lessen its importance or value. For instance, Long Dragon becomes Lu Long, right. dragon like, not a real dragon. When the character Lu is added before like it, the or the name Lu Song means substitute Song Empire or Lesser Song Empire. The history of the Song Dynasty was compiled under Toktokan in 1345. In it, the Mongols recount the final and complete destruction of Nan Song, Southern Song Empire, in 1127 through 1279 AD. During that year, the Mongol fleet crushed the Imperial Navy of the Southern Song Empire at the naval battle of Namen and the loyal minister of the left, Liu Jifu, committed suicide with the last non-Song emperor, the child of Song Jinping, rather than be captured by the Mongols. Right. The great admiral, Zhang Shiji, escaped with his Grand Armada, but were later annihilated by a typhoon while crossing the seas. Alternate sources reviewed the account of the destruction of Zhang Shiji's Grand Armada as nothing more than Mongol propaganda, since there were no eyewitness accounts of its destruction, nor were there traces left of its remnants. For most historians, the fate of Zhang Shiji and his Grand Armada remains a mystery. Contemporary Chinese historians in Guangdong are now even questioning the Mongolian accounts regarding Emperor Bing's death. Even though Mongol sources claim that the corpse of the last emperor had been found washed ashore along the coast of Shenzhen, his actual grave is yet to be found. Hmm. Cantonese folklore expressed in the traditional Cantonese opera narrates an alternative account where the loyal minister Liu Jufu tricked the Mongols by committing suicide with his own son disguised as the young emperor. Oh, it's sad. The real emperor was said to have been smuggled out of the scene of battle by Grand Admiral Zhang Qiji, who will eventually return to redeem the empire from the invaders. The travels of Marco Polo also recounts the escape of the last Song emperor across the ocean. Zhang Shiji's fleet and the last emperor may have escaped to pre-colonial Philippines and established the Luzon Empire, wow. the Lesser Song Empire. Despite the conjectures regarding its origins, the main annals are clear on the actual existence of the Kingdom of Luzon. It records that in the fifth year of the main emperor Hongwu, in 1372, the kingdom of Luzon sent its first among the many succeeding diplomatic missions to the great Ming Empire, 1368 through 1644, accompanied by the embassies of India's Chola Empire. In 1405, so he's saying that the emperor, one of the emperors down in China, fled to Luzon and created the Luzon Empire. That's interesting. According to the veritable records of the Ming Empire. The Ming court assigned envoys to the Kingdom of Luzon to invite them to send emissaries to China. It was also listed by the same records as one of the places visited by Admiral Zhang He in the years 1405 through 1433. The Ming chroniclers also added the character for Kingdom, Guo, after Luzon, indicating that it was once an independent and sovereign kingdom. Her rulers were acknowledged as kings who sent proper envoys and not mere chieftains. The main huh. empire treated the kingdom of Luzon more favorably than Japan by allowing it to trade with China once every two years, while Japan What's was every two only years? allowed to trade once every 11 years. 11 years? The kingdom of Luzon <laughs> flourished during the latter half of the Ming Dynasty when China closed its doors to foreign trade. Foreigners were forbidden to send trade missions to China. Chinese merchants were likewise forbidden to trade beyond the borders of the Great Ming Empire. That's sad. Yet clandestinely, merchants from Guangzhou and Quanzhou regularly delivered trade goods to Tondo. Luzon merchants then traded them all across Southeast Asia and were considered Chinese by the people they encountered. The Portuguese who came to Asia much earlier... I don't get why they would stop trade with anybody outside of China. I, I feel like that's going to slow your economy down, if you can call it economy then. I guess that's the correct term. But uh, 
I find it find it kind of funny that anybody they trade with uh, after they got blocked from China, they considered Chinese. So wherever they went around Southeast Asia. Earlier than the Spaniards recorded their encounter with the inhabitants of the kingdom of Luzon and called them Lucios, Luzons. The courts that the Luzon Empire played an active role in the politics and economy of 16th century Southeast Asia, especially in controlling the trade traffic at the Straits of Malacca. The kingdom of Luzon's powerful presence in the trade of Chinese goods in the 16th century East Asia was felt strongly by Japan, whose merchants had to resort to piracy in order to obtain much sought after Chinese products such as silk and porcelain. Hmm. Famous 16th century Japanese merchants and tea connoisseurs like Shimai Shoshinsu and Kamiya Soten established their branches here. One famous Japanese merchant, Luzon Sukezaimon, went as far as to change his surname from Naya to Luzon. Tondo had always been the traditional capital of the kingdom of Luzon. Its traditional rulers were the Lakumbula, meaning Lord of the Palace. During the reign of Paduka Sri Bajinda Raja Damian di Bertuan Bodhika, 1485-1521, the Kingdom of Brunei decided to break the Kingdom of Luzon's monopoly in the China trade by attacking Tondo and establishing the city-state of Nainila as a- So now you know if your last name is Luzon, um, you have some super, super deep history. Um, pretty awesome. Bruneian satellite. A new dynasty under the Sailia was established in Manila to challenge the house of Lacambula in Tondo. When the Spaniards arrived in 1571, the unity of the Kingdom of Luzon was already threatened by the uneasy alliance of three kingdoms of Luzon. Right. The Raja Makanda of Saipa, the Lakambula of Tondo and Raja Sulima Mugur, the Raja Muda of the Prince of Mainila, and Laxmana, or Grand Admiral of the Maccabi Amada. Powerful states like Lubao, Betis, and Maccabede became bold enough to challenge the traditional leadership of Tondo and Mainila. Big challenge. The Spaniards took advantage of the chaos, playing favorites with one ruler and pitted them all against one another. Ah. Rumor had it that the Spaniards had poisoned the Raja Makanda of Mainila so as to win the support of the Lakandula of Pondo, disregarding the legitimacy of Raja Suleiman III as Raja Muda. The Spaniards installed the child Baja Bagdo as the new king of Mainila. Spaniards playing some tricks. Deep, deep tricks. In 1571, Raja Suleiman III, the Raja Muda of Manila, and Laxmana of the Macabebe Armada challenged the Spaniards to a naval battle at the estuary of Mancusia. The Spaniards were able to crush Raja Suleiman ah. III and his Maccabi Armada due to lack of support from the other rulers. Oh, the that kingdom sucks. of Luzon was then quickly overtaken by the Spaniards. Its territories were carved out and distributed as spoils among themselves. Papanga was the first Spanish colonial province carved out of the kingdom of Luzon. And the people who spoke one language from Tondo to the rest of Papanga are now called Papampanga. Papampanga. After the collapse of the Kingdom of Luzon, the Spaniards were finally able to create their first colony in Asia, the Philippines, named in the honor of the Spanish King Philip II. The lame Luzon was given to the entire northern Philippine island in memory of the former Kingdom of Luzon. So now we know why the Philippines is named the Philippines and why Luzon, the area today, is named Luzon. Uh, very interesting. I've learned a lot. The kingdom of Luzon was said to have finally ended in 1571 according to Spanish records. Yet the fortified cities of Lubao and Betis continued to thrive as independent principalities of the kingdom of Luzon until 1572. In 1575, the Spaniards executed the child king Raja Bago Dang. and his cousin Lumalan as part of their response to Limahong's invasion. Evil people. The Spaniards suppressed the ruling families of Luzon 
has to be in a secret communication with the Chinese pirate fleet. The La Candula of Tondo also died in the same year. In 1586, the Spaniards crushed the revolt of former nobles of the Kingdom of Luzon in the province of Papanga. The revolt was based in Candaba under the leadership of Don Nicholas Manangrita and Don Juan de Manila. In 1588, the Spaniards crushed the revolt of the nobles of the Kingdom of Luzon in Tondo. It was led by the descendants of the Lacandula and their new kinsmen with the assistance of the influential Japanese merchants of Sakai. Many of them, including the Japanese Christian merchants Juan Gallo and Dioncio Fernandez, were executed. Man. Some, like the ruler of Kandaba, Dioncio Capulong, were exiled and their properties confiscated. In 1590, of oppression of Cambodia sent two elephants to the king of Luzon through his Portuguese ambassador and requested the kingdom of Luzon's assistance in their battle against Siam. And for some elephants? Year, the lords of the kingdom of Luzon were said to have been corresponding with the Taiko Sama of Japan, Toratomi Hideyoshi, begging for assistance to help liberate Luzon from the Spaniards. Yes. Hideyoshi responded by sending a letter to the Spanish governor of Manila demanding that the Spaniards leave Luzon quietly or face the full scale invasion that would force them out. Oh. Well prepared for a Japanese invasion, the Spanish governor of Manila decided to appease Hideyoshi by sending gifts from the Americas, including the two elephants sent by the King of Cambodia. Huh. The rulers of the old Kingdom of Luzon, who cooperated with the Spanish overlords, became the principality of the new Spanish colony. To this day, their descendants still play an influential role in Philippine society. Wow. A large community and two burial sites dating back to the Southern Song to the early Yuan Dynasty that was destroyed by previous volcanic eruptions have been partially excavated since the 1930s in Hyensia, Ramona, near the Pasig River in Hoa, Banga province. Due to lack of funds and government support, the site has been constantly abandoned to the elements and treasure hunters. Some are I hate I hate how, you know, we hear and especially through comments, lack of government support, lack of government support, lack of government support, whether it be an invention or discoveries like this. There needs to be some kind of organization or something that supports inventions and uh, discoveries and this type of stuff. They're just somebody with a lot of money needs to create an organization to help these things along because it, uh, it's only a positive thing for the Philippines. Archaeologists speculate that this may have been the original site of the Luzon capital of Tondo, it being located next to the Pasig River. Throughout the centuries, Kapampangong writers, historians, and poets all wrote about a lost Kapampangong empire that was destroyed by the Spaniards upon their conquest of the islands in the 16th century. Dig deep, it's there. The name Kapampangong is hard to come by in any pre Hispanic sources. This is understandable. The Spaniards carved out the province of La Panga from the former Kingdom of Luzon in 1571 and named it after the Indong Kapapangang River. <laughs> Only were the inhabitants of the new colonial province then called Kapapangangans. The study of Philippine history has for many years been Eurocentric. Most Philippine historians have gone as far back as the earliest Spanish records but have failed to look into the archives of neighboring countries such as Brunei. Indonesia, Cambodia, That's smart. Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, and China. Yeah, look at it all. Their dependence on the English language limits the majority of Filipino historians from accessing volumes of material written in Chinese and other Asian languages. As a result, the history of the Kingdom of Luzon remains mythical that and lost. the scholastic psyche and still virtually non-existent in mainstream Philippine history. Wow. When the Spanish foreigners came to the islands, they destroyed the kingdoms and dynasties that were already existing there. That's sad. Native Filipino customs and identity were nearly destroyed by the Latin culture that engulfed all of what anyone would now consider to be the Philippine Islands. Few records remain as to what existed before the Spanish destruction. What has been discovered was not only native dynasties such as Luzon, but there were actually native Philippine writing scripts the sign of a developed nation and of a powerful empire. 
people may never Power. know the maximum extent of what kind of language existed in the Philippines before the Spanish destruction, or how many total written languages existed. So but lost we history. We know of a few examples that survived, even when the Spanish attempted to erase its existence. One of the most extensive is the Babayan, as we now consider it today to be a true native Philippine written language. Usually, the letters look astonishing. To the untrained eye, it looks roughly Indian, which it is. That's what I thought. This language is a variation of the Sanskrit used in India, giving credit to the ancient myth that most of Southeast Asia was mostly Indianized except for certain regions, notably Anam and Luzon, which were Sinocized, even though there is evidence that shows that Luzon also had ancient Japanese influence as well. At wow. this point in time, there's no absolute universally agreed explanation as to how the Babayan was created. One theory suggests that the language came to that region of the Philippines through trade with the other island empire of Southeast Asia, Shirjaya, as the Babayan is similar to Javanese. But that would make sense that, you know, maybe it came through trade, but why can't we say and think it originated there? Um, you know, why, why, why couldn't it originate there? I realize India is a very ancient place, but it sounds like the Philippines is pretty ancient as well. Um, so, who, who really knows? I guess it's speculation. Language of Sri Jaya and predecessor of Indonesian. One interesting fact of the Babayan is that in the traditional way of writing it, you would write the characters from the bottom to the top. An unusual method of writing. Another different method of writing would be Arabic where the characters are written from right to left. To have a written language this complex shows an excellent example as to how complex the Babayan is. Not right. all of the islands that Sounds make up tough. the modern nation of the Philippines use the Babayan. Another example being the southern Philippines, which was the realm of the Sulu. Sulu. This region used Arabic, but this is not native Filipino, but Middle Eastern origin. Right. Babayan is considered native Filipino script, as why many Filipino people are fascinated with it when they learn of its existence. Let's compare the ancient Babayan written language, which is true Filipino, to a modern definition of native Filipino language. The Tagalog spoken language is the only example currently of a quote-unquote native Filipino language. Okay. But it's essentially a mix of various native Filipino languages, Spanish and English. Mixed together. Partly huh. native, true, ethnic Filipino. As Babayan is more of a pure Filipino language than Tagalog in some circumstances. When the Spanish Baba first Yan. arrived in the islands, they were amazed that this was no haven of savages but the islands were home to advanced empires and using written language, the Babayan being one of them. The Babayan script was actually in use during the Spanish colonial era, being in widespread use and public knowledge until the late 1800s, which was at that time roughly the end of Spanish rule. Which makes me think, why is Babayan not used today? I guess Spanish had a lot to say about that. Because he's repeated a, a couple times, you know, we already know Spanish was trying to erase a lot of the old history and rewrite it to their history. So it's kind of sad that the Babayan maybe, you know, not not being used, you know, because it was being used today. Uh, I guess Tagalog wouldn't be here. It would be very minimal in the Philippines. It's just, you know, when you watch videos like this and you react to videos like this, um, it leaves you with more questions, like it fills you full of knowledge, but it also empties you out a little bit because it's like, man, I have this question, that question, this question, and maybe these questions, you know, might never get answered because it sounds like you need to know a lot of languages and do a lot, a lot of research to figure these questions out. I don't know. Um, it's filling me up and then it's emptying me out at the same time when I'm watching this. I don't know about you guys. Let's keep going. The end came because by this time nearly all of the Philippines was completely Latinized, with only certain regions escaping this fate. With the Spanish rule, native Filipino culture and identity were replaced with Latin aspects. Native Filipino names were replaced with Spanish names, 
cities and islands were renamed with Spanish names. Mm. And lastly, language was changed. Yeah, it's got the Babayan, mixed around. along with other written languages, was not passed to future generations because previous ones did not have the time to teach it to their descendants or believed it to be hedonistic and outdated. Favoring Spanish or later English when the Americans took over from Spain in controlling the islands. In the modern Philippines, the Babayan language is not necessarily understood. First reason right. being that after independence, Babayan was not known among the people enough to be the national language. Right. Seeing how by this time in the 1940s, the first generation of Filipino readers were roughly the grandsons of the last Babayan writers. They did not know the language, and it was not viable as the language of the country. Not enough to teach. If the did not know the language, then how would the people? Second reason that English seemed more favorable than the Babayun as the national language along with Tagalog. Both were in use and much easier to teach in some ways than the Babayun. Makes sense. Third reason being that Babayun was never standardized, as there were different regional variations of the language. Different dialects. One written text may appear slightly different if it was read in different regions of the country. There was never any single form of the language adopted anywhere in the Philippines. That definitely hold it back. The obvious reason why the written language is not the official script of the country today. Some might be wondering, he answered would it. Babayan ever be readopted on the national level? Possibly yes, possibly no. Again, there were other forms of written language in the Philippines before the Spanish destruction. Yet the Babayan seems to be one of the few examples that can be reteached on a nationwide level. <laughs> when the Spanish destroyed native Philippine culture to replace it with the Latin culture, the Filipino people were forced to read, speak, and write in Spanish. There might have been right. even more advanced script than the Babayan, but we will never know. Oh, never All know. that remains is the Babayan and a few other written examples of native Filipino text. My own personal view is that there is a slight chance, with China retaking its position as the most powerful Asian nation, all countries in Northeast and Southeast Asia are slowly appreciating their own Asian cultures once more. There's no more absolute faith in westernization. The Philippines might appreciate its own ancient culture, what is left of it, and might want to recreate it for future generations. It might be teached regionally at first, and this might spread to other areas, and then finally, possibly on a nationwide level. I think that would be awesome. If the Babayan written script does not ever gain widespread understanding again, there are still those people who know of its existence. It survives despite the Spanish attempts to destroy it. And through videos it like survives. this. And with that, a whole new generation of Filipino people will learn who they are and what it means to them. It survives. And an international audience can see just how advanced the islands of the Philippines yes. once was. I have spoken about the Philippines. Good point. How it was once perhaps the most powerful and diverse of Southeast Asia before the Spanish destruction. When the Spaniards came in 1521, this marks the end of everything. I have had many comments and requests to once again speak of the history of this country before the Spanish destruction. Right. I have actually did history about it before, but I will now do the most detailed historical account I can possibly do to the demands of the viewers, listeners, and subscribers. Heck yeah. The lost kingdoms range from a native Luzon kingdom to another kingdom founded by a minor prince from an Indian empire, to a confederacy founded by exiles from an ancient Indonesian state, and an Islamic sultanate that was able to completely evade Spanish colonization. That's amazing. And last but not least, one ancient kingdom that existed before the Spanish destruction and still exists to this day. But you would never think of all that when you look at a modern map of the Philippines. It is completely unheard of. When you see maps or timelines of Northeast or Southeast Asia, many have asked, why is the Philippines never included on the map, while neighboring regions like Malaysia and Indonesia are? I never thought about this that. This is where the truth lies. Or does not. When Malaysia and Indonesia became European colonies, most of their pre-European heritage and history remained during the occupation. With the Philippines, it did not. 
As was Spanish and Portuguese custom when they were building their empires, the native culture and identity of the conquered nation and people was destroyed. They get erased it. Oh. Portuguese crowns thought that by demoralizing the people they conquered, they will be easier to control. That makes me sad. Right. For a time at least. Another factor was that when the British and Dutch controlled Anam, Malaya, and Srivijaya, now called Malaysia, Burma, and Indonesia, they actually just controlled the population. Most of the culture remained, but basic customs had to be forced upon the people such as dress, presentation, and language. The same thing occurred when the French occupied Anam and Tonkin, now called Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. However, when the Europeans took possession of these regions, they were not unified in the way we imagine today. In all cases, they were smaller settlements that became larger as the native dynasty or kingdom became weaker, such as the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, or the tributary nation became weaker. Hence, that just makes me, that makes me super sad, you know, a lot of other other nations got to keep their customs while the Philippines was losing their customs because of the Spanish and that's what they did they they tried to erase everything about it so I guess the Spanish have cost you know people today to not know where they come from you know obviously videos like this educates us but how much of the history is lost how much of the history we'll never know because of what the Spanish did ah uh, it's just it just angers you a little bit, right? It angers you a little bit. It angers me. China's vassal states of Burma, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Spain controlled the Philippines from 1521 to 1898. That's 377 years. The British controlled Burma from 1824 to 1948. 124 years. Right. The French controlled Indochina from 1887 to 1954. 67 years. Not much. The British controlled Malaysia from 1826 to 1946. 120 years. The Portuguese controlled Macau from 1557 to 1999. 442 years. The British controlled Hong Kong from 1842 to 1947. That's 155 years. If we use these years as a basis, then the Philippines was the second oldest European transformed region in Northeast or Southeast Asia. Wow. Macau was not a colony in the traditional sense. It was mostly a port, not even used that much until the mid to late 1800s. The Philippine Islands were used more commercially by the Spanish on their routes from Mexico. In many respects, Vital. Luzon was under foreign control longer than any other power. With this in mind, it's easy to understand why the Philippines has lost its Asian heritage. When we look at a map, the Philippines is south of China and the west of Vietnam. It should have had more contact than Malaysia and Indonesia. Perhaps it did, but we will never know. Here's something <sighs> Too many never knows. The Philippines is the only Roman Catholic nation in Asia, anywhere in Asia. And Asia is a very large region of the world. Yeah, it is. Isn't it odd? It's a legacy of the Spanish who forcefully converted most of the population to Christianity during their control of the region. What existed in the region before the Spanish Christianity crusade? Once again, only few records remain. It's time for the truth to be known. From here on, in the narration, these islands will not be called by its western name. We will once again call these regions by their ancient and true titles. You should. Actually, the oldest of the ancient realms was Tondo, also called Luzon or Luzon. Luzon. This kingdom has no establishment date. There is no records that give proof to when it was formed. Got a race. Spanish records show that it was conquered in 1589. The oldest document in the Philippines date to the year of 900. The document itself, the Laguna copper plate inscription, was discovered in 1989 and caused a sensation. It was estimated that record keeping began after the Spanish destruction in 1589, but this predates that by centuries. Centuries? Tondo was in existence for possibly centuries before the Spanish arrived on those shores. Centuries? In the ancient days, there was the Lacan, which was the equivalent of king. Tondo had a series of kings as they were called the Lacandula, while the nobles called Tatu were the nobility of the region, not just of Luzon but of other regions as well. Indian in origin, the term Tatu was changed to Don during the Spanish destruction. Although the constitution currently prohibits granting new titles of Tatu, descendants of Tatu 
may keep the title. The next reference to Tondo is in Ming Dynasty records. There is an account of trade with Tondo in the Ming court referring to the people as kings, not as chieftains or savages. It reflects a wider scope of ancient Chinese contact with the islands. It also gives proof to ancient accounts of Chinese settling in the islands and marrying local women. Thus, a region why so many people in the north look Chinese. Makes sense. They are. Ancient Chinese had control with local tattoo and even arguably influenced the islands with Ming support. The Spanish first came to Manila Bay in 1570. The Spanish, after hearing word of a wealthy and powerful Muslim settlement on Luzon, sent a conquistador to take the region. The ruler of the kingdom of Manila at the time, Raja Suleiman II, refused to submit to Spanish rule. Right. Defeated by the Spanish invaders, Manila would be then claimed by the Spanish. Refusing to accept the loss of their homeland to the invaders, the natives burned Manila to the ground rather than see Manila in all its glory My goodness. in Spanish control. The kingdom of Manila. Modern day Manila is named in part for this ancient kingdom, having been established by the fifth sultan of the kingdom of Brunei. The establishment is sometime in the early 1500s as Manila will be conquered by the Spanish in 1571. Kingdom of Butuan, not to be confused with the other kingdom of Bhutan, this was an ancient Indianized kingdom centered on the present Mindano, island city of Butuan. It was known for its mining of gold, its gold products, and extensive trade network across the Nusantara area. Trading relationships with the ancient civilizations of Japan, China, India, Indonesia, Persia, Cambodia, and areas now comprised in Thailand. The time of establishment is unknown. Rulers of Batuan have relations with these ancient Southeast Asian kingdoms of Champa, now within present-day Vietnam. Song Dynasty records show that Batuan had foreign relations as early as the year 1000. This deep respect and fear of China from Batuan sparked favoritism in the Chinese court, and dynasties after Song kept in contact with Batuan. A high point was the Yuan Dynasty. Chinese records about the Raja and it stopped after the reign of Raja Siagu, the last independent Raja of Batuan. He was formally subjugated into the Spanish Empire after he made a blood compact with Ferdinand Magellan in 1521. The Rajanid of, of Cebu was a classical Philippine state which used to exist on the island of Cebu prior to the arrival of the Cebu. Spanish. It was founded by Sri Lume, or Raja Muda, Lumaya a minor prince of the Indian Chola dynasty which occupied Sumatra. He was sent by the Maharaja to establish a base for expeditionary forces, but he rebelled and established his own independent Rajanid. Founded in the year 1450, it would be dissolved by a Spanish treaty in 1565. The Confederation of Madias, which was established during the 1200s and was conquered in 1569. During the 11th century, several exiled Datus of the collapsing empire of Sri Jaya, led by Datu Pui, led a mass migration to the central islands of the Philippines, fleeing from Raja Makatuano of the island of Borneo. Upon reaching the island of Panay and purchasing the island from the Negrito chief Maripudo, they established a confederation in named the Confederation of Madias, centered in Aklan, and they settled the surrounding islands of the Visayas. This confederation reached its peak under Datu Pado Jiong. During his reign, the confederation's hegemony extended over most of the islands of Visayas. This kingdom was strong enough to make naval attacks against Chinese imperial ships. Oh. Particularly powerful kingdom, it was feared by both Tondo and Manila. Sounds strong. Mayi was another state that existed before the Spanish destruction. Centered on the island of Mindoro, records of it exist in Brunei and Song Dynasty China. The years of establishment and conquest by Spain are not exactly clear. The Sultanate of Manguindano, an Islamic state that existed just before the Spanish destruction in 1500 and was dissolved in 1898. The historical realm was the entire peninsula of Zamboanga, although at its height it controlled much of Mindano. During the Spanish destruction, the Mindano. was able to the Spanish invasion and was never colonized by Spain. Those fingers. The only kingdom which was established before the Spanish destruction to still exist, albeit in a weaker form. In 1380, Karim ul Makdum and Sharif ul Hashim Syed Abu Bakar 
an Arab trader born in Johor, arrived in Sulu from Malacca and established the Sultanate of Sulu. Sharif ul Hashim was a direct descendant of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. This Sultanate wow. eventually gained great wealth. Currently, the issue of those who would be the legitimate Sultanate of Sulu is disputed by several branches of royal families. Perhaps the strongest of all the kingdoms, Sulu fought against all invaders. Spanish, British, American, and even Philippine forces. The territory of Sulu came to be the largest of all the kingdoms. Strong the fighters. For the modern nation of the Philippines. The Sulu's territory was very distant. The Spanish never had full dominion over the Sulu as they were too dangerous and too distant to oversee. The range of Sulu covers much of the present day Philippines and even Malaysia. The Sulu survived the Spanish destruction but was gravely weakened by the American takeover. Even the Americans were not able to fully subvert the Sulu. Warriors. When the Philippine nation was created, the problem was handed over to them. As of now, the Sulu region is autonomous, not fully under Philippine control, and even to this day, few venture into its territory. Hmm. That's it. Very interesting. Very. Extremely interesting. Yes. It makes sense that the Spanish would destroy the native dynasties in the Philippines because it would absurd Spanish authority. This is why the Aztec... Maya and Inca cultures were all destroyed by Spain in Central and South America because wow. they were threats. The Philippine Islands had its native cultures, the Maya, Confederation of Maya's Kingdom of Maynila, Rajanid of Bhutan, the Rajanid of Cebu, the Sultanate of Guantanamo, and lastly the Sultanate of Sulu. Sulu is often spoken of the most because it lasted the longest. Right. It outlasted the Spanish and American eras. The only native Philippine rule to do so, as now the discussion will go to something more recent, the Sabah dispute. For a moment, let's go back Sabah. to Sulu, as a sultan would actually lease Sabah to a European power, the British, as the rights would eventually fall to Great Britain. The claim of Sabah would fall to the United States of America, and Needs to come back. the United States of America took control of the Philippines. And later, the Philippines itself would take this dispute also. The British knew that land was leased, but they would not give the land back to the British. Better give it back! To America. Instead, the British slowly integrated the land into the Malaya colony. Once Malaysia and the Philippines were independent, the claim would naturally be brought up again. Each time the Philippines brought the claim up, Malaysia would either ignore the claim altogether or give excuses as to why they should keep the Sabah region. No. It's a geopolitical reason as to why Malaysia will not return the lands of Sabah to the Philippines. You need to return it. The modern nation of Malaysia has at the moment around 27 million people living within it. The Philippines has around 94 million people living within it. Much more Malaysia now. claims to its former colonial master of the United Kingdom for defense. While the Philippines is under the watch of the United States of America. If Saba was to be returned to the Philippines, then the size of the modern nation of Malaysia would decrease nearly by half and would be at the mercy of Indonesia, which Malaysians are not exactly that big to begin with. To try and throw up the claim, the Malaysian government has actually partially colonized the region by putting Malaysian people into it and deporting Filipinos. Wow. It's a problem that still exists and will not go away so easily. Wow. This is the true history of the Philippines. From its own dynasty having relations with nearly every other country in Northeast and Southeast Asia, to the Spanish colonial era, and to the era within the United States of America. The Philippines is a truly fascinating and impressive country that demands respect. I would like to once again thank the YouTube user that brought this information to my attention to Juan Pinoy, as well as to the researcher who found out about all this information, Mike Palinian. I want to thank this guy for putting this video together so we could explore the deep, deep, ancient, hidden history of the Philippines and empires. So they want to say there was an empires in the Philippines, guess what? There was many empires in the Philippines, one of the biggest, Luzon, uh, Sulu, you know. And uh, it's amazing learning of the lost languages of the Philippines and why they are lost. Because, like he said, Spaniards, they like to erase history. 
They did it in South America and many, many places. They did it in the Philippines. And, you know, it's a shame it happened to the Philippines because he, he, was set, he was stating that nations around the Philippines, it, it wasn't like that. They, may, they Maybe they were controlled, but they didn't lose their culture. So hopefully videos like this, hopefully more evidence can be found. And through the power of internet today, we can spread it and uh, let it live long, long time. But that's amazing. Sounds like Sabah needs to be returned. It needs to be returned. Whether it's going to cut your country in half or not, it needs to be returned. I mean, that's what I was seeing. I don't know if it ever will be, but... Sorry, I got allergies going on or something. Itchy. But anyway... Learned a lot. Did you learn anything? Do you have anything else to add to this? I, thought, I found this was an amazing video, so comment down below. Feed me some information. You guys are very good at feeding me information. Lots of big, long comments. That's what I like to read. That's what I like to understand. That's what I like to learn from. Anyway, those are my thoughts. What's your thoughts? Let me know. For now, peace, love, happiness. Spread it from you to me. Later.